Hello, and welcome to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. I'm Isla Garcia, Master's Degree of Nutrition Science and Registered Dietitian, and I'm going to make weight loss realistic, sustainable, and uncomplicated for your busy lifestyle. On this podcast, me and my team of registered dietitians will decipher the latest nutrition research, dissect fad diets, and discuss social media trends for you so you can feel confident knowing what to eat to achieve your health goals. Research suggests that most weight loss programs aren't successful, but my experience has taught me that this is not because the participants aren't committed. It's because those diets are designed by non-nutrition professionals and center around severe restrictions. We are here to provide the facts about the science of weight loss so you can have the success you want and continue living your best life. Welcome back to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. My name is Isla, your founder, CEO, and host. I'm also a registered dietitian. I don't feel like I say that enough. Um, and I help clients lose weight. I use my expertise and what I've learned over the past couple of years with my clients to help you learn some practical ways to lose weight. Um, again, I'm still like trying a new uh, setup situation. I am like balancing this mic on my lap basically with this like stick and I'm a little bit further back from the camera, but at least we have like good lighting today. I was able to do this early enough in the day. So that's a plus. You can always watch this on YouTube too. If you're only listening to it um, on Spotify or Apple podcasts, but today I'm really excited about this topic. That's probably why I was able to like get on it a little bit earlier. And today I'm going to talk about what to do if you're trying to lose weight, eating, trying to eat more protein, but don't like eating meat. This is like a super specific problem that I see a lot with clients um, that they really struggle meeting their protein intake, especially if you're taller because you need more protein because the way we calculate protein is based on weight. And if you don't like getting, if you don't like eating meat, it's totally doable, but I, I would say it's very hard to hit a higher protein goal with a vegan diet because you basically have to use any excess calories to really maximize on all the protein that you get throughout the day, which is why I did post the vegan protein episode last week. Um, But this week, it's if you're not vegan and you're still okay with getting in some meat, but you're struggling with it. And I'm going to address some myths about it and then also give you some tips for problems that I see with clients. I do want to preface that this isn't a blanket statement for everybody. Again, if you're vegan, you can totally get the job done. But also, you only need to really eat more protein in certain certain circumstances in your life. If you're trying to lose weight, it's recommended to try to eat more protein for lots of reasons that we go over in lots of other podcast episodes. But just a quick and dirty is that you really feel a lot fuller when you eat protein, and so it helps you to not snack. It helps you to not have as many cravings, which helps you to be in a calorie deficit more comfortably as opposed to you just eating like all your calories and foods that won't fill you up. Um, And so when we need more protein, we want to look at foods that have more protein. However, more of anything typically means more calories. So we want to look at foods that are low in calorie and high in protein. And I think the, the, the best option is going to be meat or like flesh. When I'm saying meat for this episode, it's going to be like any animal flesh, like fish, turkey, like poultry, beef, stuff like that. Um, If you, again, are just trying to maintain your weight or you're just listening to this podcast for overall health, you absolutely don't need to be stressing about getting in more meat. This isn't like an episode about all about you. Everybody should be eating more meat and this is why, but I'm just saying for this specific circumstance of like you are wanting to lose weight, you're trying to get in more protein, but you're really struggling with eating more meat, but you want to try because it's going to help you eat in a calorie deficit. I got you. I'm going to help you today. I feel really close to this episode or this topic as well, because this is totally me. I would agree that I'm not a huge fan of meat either. Whenever I'm not trying to lose weight or I don't have to eat more protein, I do take a break and I feel like pretty much eat mostly vegetarian, if not plant-based if possible. But when I am trying to lose weight or like right now, I'm trying to eat more protein because I'm pregnant. If you didn't know, um, I will go to eating more meat just because I think it's super easy. So I kind of view meat as a flavor, a flake of flavoring agent, not really a major part of the entree. I think this just go back, goes back to like, we didn't always eat like that growing up either. Like sometimes we would have like pork tenderloin, but we were never like a grilled steak and hot dogs type of family. So I'm just kind of used to that as well. I mean, we did grow up eating like a lot of 
baked chicken or like grilled chicken on the the um what was that grill the George Foreman grill and stuff like that and then when I as I got older I also hated making it so I don't but I've found a lot of other ways to incorporate adding more meat to where I can get in 100 plus grams eating meat that don't really gross me out so I'm going to give you a lot of personal tips as well okay if you're watching this on YouTube sorry I couldn't take that setup anymore I'm just going to hold the mic and have to figure out some other option later on I think I'm missing a lot of pieces to the mic stand that's stressing me out so I'm just going to hold it and I feel a lot more comfortable and I feel like it looks a lot better um so that's my intro um as far as announcements this is coming out on the first of march so i will have a new theme for millennial living i just don't have it yet um because i'm recording this on the last day of february which is a leap day or leap year or whatever um so i'll have that together tomorrow um i guess the biggest thing is client spots so if you're interested in working with us um because i'm pregnant i will be giving birth at the end of august and i will not be taking new clients anymore for the three month program past May, just for me, just so that I don't end up like running into a problem of like having to take a forever break. So if you're wanting to work with us, especially me, take advantage of the next couple months to sign up. Lacey will probably be taking, t- still taking clients if he needed it, but all that to say for March, I've already had one person sign up. So I'll have two more spots for myself for March. And then Lacey has one spot as well. So if you're interested, go ahead and sign up for a discovery call especially because our time is limited um, as I'm going to have a baby soon. Um, I talked all about it on my Instagram, so make sure you're you're following me over there um, for more updates. But let's get into this episode because I feel like it might be a little bit of a longer one. So first, some myth busters. I have, I think, uh, four myths to bust. And I also went over these on my Instagram page. I kind of took a poll last week to kind of see where people were at, to see what people were more stressed about or scared about. And that's where a lot of this information is coming from. So make sure to follow us over there at the.millennial.nutritionist. Okay, so the first myth is that meat is unhealthy. And all of these I feel like are kind of like yes and no. Um, But it's all like on a gradient, just like with nutrition. There's not like one bad food or one good food. A lot of it has to do with the amounts you're eating. And what else does the rest of your diet look like? Um, We do know that meat is more readily absorbed than other proteins compared to like non-animal sourced proteins because there are a complete protein. So not to get into the nitty gritties of everything, but there is a thing when you're eating plant-based sources of protein, say like beans, nuts, stuff like that, that not all the amino acids are present. Some of them are, but you have to eat a varied diet to get all of them. So you're like not going to be malnourished if you are vegan, you can get it in. But all that to say that you do have to be a lot more strategic if you are vegan to get all these different Foods in, as long as you have a varied diet with lots of different fruits and vegetables and you're taking your multivitamin, you should be okay. But you just don't have to worry about that if you are eating some meat throughout the day. Meat also has a lot of vitamins and minerals. We definitely can get them from other foods. But just to say that it's not unhealthy to eat meat because it's not like we're just eating pure fat or something like that. There's a reason that some of these things are in there. We especially get a lot of iron, zinc, and vitamin A from eating meat, which means that you don't have to supplement these. So for vegans and vegetarian, for vegans especially, if you're not having meat, you do need to make sure that you're taking labs and that you're supplementing, especially with all of those B, B vitamins. And so if you're able to eat meat, it's just one less thing you have to buy. So to me, that means that meat is healthy in that we are supposed to be eating like a small amount of meat in our diet because our body would be deficient in something if we didn't. Um, just to give an idea of these vitamins and minerals. So four ounces of ground beef is about the same amount of iron that is in one cup of beans, about nine milligrams, which is about half of the daily requirement for women. So again, you definitely can get the job with beans, but the problem that I see is for people who don't like eating meat or beef, a lot of times they're not going to make the effort to make sure they get in a full cup of pinto beans or something like that. If you're doing that, great. But if you're not, don't be avoiding it just because you think that there's nothing nutritional about meat or beef. Um, Zinc is something that really helps with our immune system. We need about eight, I think it's milligrams uh, a day. And just for reference, about three and a half ounces of ground beef is going to give us five milligrams and six oysters provide us with 33 milligrams, which is about 300% of what we need. So we can really get a lot of benefits from eating different types of meat, seafood and stuff like that, that helps us overall be healthy. So I definitely want to say that meat is not unhealthy all the time. Um, I think another thing that comes to mind when this statement comes up is cancer. And there was some research recently that linked 
red meat to colon cancer. Um, cancer stuff is always really hard. And I don't want to like trip up on my words too much because I get a little nervous talking about it. But I did some digging and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and I'll link the study or the link, found that you could potentially have an 18% higher chance of colon cancer for every 50 grams of processed meat eaten. However, if we compare that to a very well-known carcinogen like smoking, that's going to give us a a thousand to 3000% chance of developing cancer. So again, it's like, I don't really think that anything is absolutely harmless. So let's look at things that we absolutely should avoid and then look at things that may be beneficial. Like smoking, I would say is absolutely not beneficial at any point, but meat can be beneficial at different points. Does it mean that we need to be eating at breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day? No, but I don't think it's this like huge bad thing that a lot of people make it out to be. And they actually did a little bit of digging in the study too and found that there's possibly no difference when you eat the same amount of produce. That's the only thing that's very hard with nutritional studies is like, it's very hard to isolate what the exact thing is that's causing a disease. Because if you give somebody a pure meat-based diet versus a diet that's vegan, it's probably going to force them to eat more fruits and vegetables compared to a pure meat diet or something like that, right? But if you're able to control the amount of produce and give the meat people the same amount of produce as that you give the vegan people, they're questioning if that is going to help people avoid cancer. So again, nutrition research is always really hard to parse out what is the actual thing causing, but there are some questions that are being asked about, is there, is it something we should absolutely be avoiding all the time for cancer? So just some food for thought to think about that. We, I don't think we totally need to be afraid of all meat when it comes to cancer. And then that study specifically is for red meat. There's a lot of other meats that I'm going to go into that can be really helpful if you're wanting to avoid it for that reason. Do you love our realistic approach on nutrition, but want to dive a little bit deeper? Let me tell you about the millennial living membership program. This was designed to help you stay motivated and inspired no matter what health journey you're on. We develop monthly nutrition and fitness challenges with prizes you can win if you stick with it to help motivate you through every month. To inspire you, we upload weekly recipes with downloadable food lists, monthly food demos, and we can even have a registered dietitian answer your questions on nutrition and weight loss. Our members form a community with other like-minded people to help support each other on their health journey. If you are seeking a way to stay motivated throughout your health journey with our method in mind, try signing up for the Millennial Living Membership Program for the first two weeks free by signing up on our website at themillennialnutritionist.com. So the next myth is that there are more foodborne illnesses with meat, um, and a lot of the y'all believe this. And Yes, I guess. I don't know. So I was like, again, doing more research because these this is not really my forte, but I did have to learn about it in college. So I know where to look and I know the general ideas of the answers here. And the biggest thing when it comes to this that I don't think people fully understand, or maybe you do, is that there are more foodborne illnesses when it comes to meat if you're eating undercooked meat. And when I was looking at the research, it says that a lot of these foodborne illnesses from meat come from eating at restaurants because restaurants sometimes are going to care more about the taste and the safety of it. Um, a lot of times that's why there's their asterisks of on the menu of like eating undercooked food can lead to blah, blah, blah. And you're taking on that risk. But if you're cooking at a home, you're able to completely cook out like things like salmonella if it's cooked to the right temperature. The only time that you might get it get some sort of disease from meat is if you are undercooking it at home or the slight chance that like it, the juice has splattered, like the raw juice has splattered on the counter. And then you touch that with your hand and put it in your mouth, you know, stuff like that. It's not as common as you would think if you're cooking things at home and cooking it to the right temperature. So if you are worried about this, some things that you can do is make sure to use separate cutting boards when it comes to meat. This is something that I do. And also making sure to not use those like wooden cutting board cutting boards when it comes to meat. only use the plastic because they're not going to absorb everything. So use separate cutting boards when you're cooking meat and fruits and vegetables in the same thing. 
measure the internal temperature and make sure it's cooked up to the temperature it needs to be. There's super easy references online and also don't wash chicken. I don't know. I don't know if people do this or not. I don't do this, but I also am not really cooking chicken a lot. Um, but it said that that's another big way you can spread salmonella is if you are washing your raw chicken because it's going to splatter everything. Again, remember that it does completely cook out the salmonella if you cook it to temperature. The salmonella is present in the raw stuff. So don't worry about you needing to wash things off before you cook things because that's actually going to make it worse because it splatters everything. I found also something interesting. When we look at the context of everything that you might get sick from when it comes to food and the largest amount of illnesses and hospitalizations were actually from potato salad, which is crazy. And it's not even from the eggs. They said it's just from lots of things getting cut up and putting inside it. And then also from it, food sitting out. Um, also from tomato. Tomatoes was the next biggest thing. Then salad, then chicken, then ice. The name of the game when it comes to avoiding foodborne illnesses is making sure things are cooked. I couldn't find anything about eating something that is fully cooked is going to cause you to get sick unless it's been like sitting out days and days and days. That's why as a pregnant person, I'm still supposed to avoid the deli aisle, I'm supposed to avoid anything that's been sitting out for a long time. You can eat it if it's freshly cooked because that's the lowest amount chance of you getting sick from it. If you're afraid, again, cook the meat all the way through and just wash your counters down after, and it's going to be very hard for you to get a foodborne illness that way. The next myth is that it's less sustainable to eat meat. This is a hard one, and I don't always love talking about it because I feel like there's not a definite answer. So I'm just going to bring up some questions and some interesting thought points. We did a we did record a podcast with a professor from Texas A&M who talked about sustainability of cattle. And there's an argument to be made that eating beef might be more sustainable than not. And so I'm just wanting, and I can link it. So I'm, I just want to bring up that it's not everything is black and white. Again, we always want to look at everything in the largest picture possible. And so that's what I'm going to do for you here. Um, it might not be true that it's less sustainable, that it's less sustainable to eat meat. Yes, meat produces more greenhouse gas, especially with beef. But the benefit is that it's giving us protein versus if we don't ever eat meat and you're not going to be super diligent about getting in those beans and tofu, all you're left with is just carbs. So anything is going to have a trade-off in life. And yes, the trade-off is producing more greenhouse gas, but it's giving us something that we need. That's very surface level. And yes, there's a lot of changes that probably should be made to make sure we're not like overproducing things and stuff like that, but it's not all for harm. Just for example, an example, we only get about like eight to 10 grams of protein with four ounces of tofu versus 25 to 30 grams for four ounces of beef. So I want you to think about all the resources that go into creating that four ounce piece of tofu versus all the resources that are going to go into creating a four ounce piece of beef as well. I don't know the answer to this because I don't have time to full-time be a researcher for what is the better answer when it comes to sustainability. If you have anybody that you know I should put on my podcast and answer these questions, That'd be great. But I think that's something we overlook a lot of the times is the nutritional benefit we're getting from something that yes, is going to take more resources, but also gives us more in return. So the question isn't, it's a bad thing. The question is like, are we overproducing? Are we utilizing everything we need out of this animal that's going to give us a huge amount of nutrition? According to UC Davis, I was trying to find resources that are not super biased in any direction. And a lot of that is universities. Um, in order for you, like when we look at the impact of eliminating or reducing beef in our diet, just because again, beef is the animal that's going to create probably the most impact on the environment in a negative way. Um, when we look at what's going to happen, if we reduce our intake of beef, eating one pound of beef is equivalent to burning one to five gallons of gas. So I think you could think about that as well. It's like beef isn't the only thing that's going to degrade our environment. There's so many other things that we do on a daily basis. And it's kind of like maybe pick your poison. So you could also, if, if you're really trying to lose weight and you're really struggling with not eating meat and you feel bad because of the sustainability piece of it, maybe say, hey, for this temporary period of time, I'm just going to maybe drive my car less while I eat more beef to kind of offset that, if that's a possibility for you. Another calculation that was brought up is that if you're, a lot of these, another thing with this is that a lot of these statements, they're not 
maybe even applicable to you. Cause when a lot of people are talking about, we need to be eating less beef, we need to be eating less meat. It's based on that the average person is eating one pound of beef per week. I don't eat one pound of beef per week. I maybe eat a half a pound of beef every month. And I don't think I've worked with a lot of clients that are eating one pound of beef. Now, I don't work with a lot of men who are trying to bodybuild. Maybe that's more that area, but I just, just take in context too of like how much you're even eating. But if we take the average person eating one pound of beef per week and cut that in half forever, it would uh, be the same as you driving 54 fewer miles per week for the next 20 years. So again, it might, doesn't, if you're trying to worry about the environment, the answer doesn't always have to be this beef or meat situation. If you are worried about it, you can do other things like eat meats, maybe with less impact. So something like pork, chicken, farmed fish are going to have way less of an impact on the environment and still help you meet your protein goals. Um, other solutions that aren't meat-based are eating produce that is in season is really, it's said in these articles, one of the biggest things you can do as far as what you're eating to help because it has to use way less resources. And it even brought up an interesting point that it doesn't matter where it's coming from because if you're eating something that's not in season but local, it might take more resources versus eating all the oranges from Florida that are in season right now. And also eating whole grains so you're not wasting the nutrients. I think that's another major argument to be made is like a lot, a lot of food that we eat is taking a lot of resources and the best way we can work around that is by not having food waste. And that kind of starts with making sure you're eating a whole versions of these things, which is also healthier. So it all kind of works together. That's my two cents on environmentalism. <laughs> Definitely not an ecologist or anything. So feel free to bring up arguments, but these are even things that I think about all the time too, is we just need to think of like the bigger picture. And there's not one thing, like when I think about nutrition, there's not like one answer. It's more just like the greater sum of everything like, can you take less flights? Can you walk somewhere instead of drive somewhere? Can you go to the thrift store instead of constantly buying new clothes? Like stuff like that. And I'd love to have somebody on the podcast to just like generally give us some advice on what it looks like to make changes nutritionally versus not nutritionally for the environment, but just some things to bring up. So you don't have to be so afraid of eating meat and that it's going to like burn down our whole planet. The fourth myth or problem with you eating meat is that you feel bad for the animals. Yes. I feel bad for the animals too. I've seen all the videos and I think about like all the bad things when it comes to why this animal ended up on my plate. But the one thing I think about is that we are omnivores. That's how we have developed the cavemen back in the day ate meat. So it's something that we do need to do for our biology or it's how we have survived. So our bodies run optimally having some sort of meat. And it's also just a part of the food chain and it's the circle of life. I also hate watching National Geographic and seeing like the poor water buffalo getting eaten by the crocodile, but it is just the circle of life. It is just the truth of how life works. I think the biggest thing we can do is just appreciate meat and don't waste it. Like I said, eat all of it. Don't try to throw things out. Be very, very appreciative of how that animal got on your plate. And I think it's another thing to, if you have a hunter in your family or you live in the country or you ever go to the farmer's market and you see those people that hunt and have like deer and stuff like that, that might be a good way to also be a little bit more sustainable and appreciate the whole of the animal that you're eating. So I totally feel ya. And again, we only really need to be eating more protein when we're trying to lose weight. So just try to not think about it too much while you're in this time. Okay. So solutions for if you don't like eating meat. So one of the big things I get is texture and I have four solutions for you just so you know how far this goes. So texture, if texture is a thing for you, which it can be a thing for me for sure. Um, I would recommend ground meat options. And that's honestly going to be my recommendation for all these things. I feel like every time I eat meat, it's normally ground. Um, that brings us to Turkey, beef, chicken, sausage, I think it's a really great way to hide it in something and it doesn't even fully taste like meat or like have that texture. And when I bring it up to clients, they also agree. Another thing is maybe doing something like shredded chicken. So you could boil chicken and shred it. I've done that before, or it's really easy to do that in the crock pot. I'm not a full, like I'm going to eat a chicken breast type of person because I do get afraid of not being able to cook it all the way through since it's really thick, but I love putting chicken in the crock pot and it really breaks down so easily. 
somehow it like overcooks it, but it's still moist, especially if you just like put a whole thing of salsa. That's one of my favorite things to do and shred it. And it is a little less meaty. And then the other thing I think is fish. This really helps me with the texture thing because it's softer, especially something like cod or flounder or like fried catfish or something like that is just a different type of texture. I feel like when it comes to meat compared to like chicken or beef, it's like very stringy. So if you are in need of some alternative meat recipes, I just want to plug Millennial Living. I mostly put the recipes in there that I, I'm eating or that I think some something that like came up in a client call. So anything I talk about today will probably be brought up over there and you always get your two weeks free if you sign up through our website. So you can check that out and kind of peruse the recipes in there. The second problem might be that you don't know how to cook it. And I also understand, I feel like I didn't really grow up eat like cooking a lot of just like straight up meat. Again, we would do like a lot of lasagna, spaghetti, fish, but we didn't just, again, like cook these full cuts of meat. So anytime I want to do that, I have to teach myself. So and again, ground meats, if you're starting from scratch, cooking meat, or you're really intimidated by it, I think ground meat is the easiest way to go because I feel you, you can like physically see when it's done cooking because it's not pink anymore. It's also like less thick. So it's harder to undercook it as opposed to those really thick meats are a lot easier to undercook. Um, it's also could be helpful to cut it into smaller pieces. This is something that I do. Like if I want to make a stir fry with beef, I'll just cut it into smaller pieces. And then that way I can also check to see if it's cooked through. And I think it's easier to cook it that way. Boiling is also a very easy option for protein, especially for something like shrimp. We have a shrimp cocktail recipe in our program because I think it's a very simple way to get in protein. And then chicken, you could easily, like I said, boil chicken and then shred it. And that can be an easy protein for you that week. Another idea is marinated tenderloin packets. This is something else that I utilize a lot. Aldi has like a turkey tenderloin that I probably use once a month. It literally says the directions on there. You just like put it in a dish and you put it in the oven. And I just put the thermometer in to make sure it's done. And I think it always comes out really great. So if you are nervous to cook something, I think these options are way less intimidating. And you could also take a cooking course. We had on some dietitians who have online cooking courses. They're called To Taste. So I'll also link that episode and you can check out if you're really, really wanting to learn more about cooking meat and have the time. I think that would be a great option. The third problem that you might be having is you don't like handling raw meat. And again, I totally feel you. This is so me. I wish I was that person who would like be able to buy a whole chicken and make the chicken broth and like save money and use all the different parts of the chicken. But this will just never be me. When I'm cooking, I need to use the least amount of time to have all of the gross juices out as possible. And how do I do this? Ground meat. <laughs> Again, ground. I hope nothing bad ever comes out about ground meat. Um, ground meat is how I do it. I made a soup today. It was like a tortellini and sausage soup. And it was just like breakfast sausage that was already ground. And I literally just tore open the packet and put it in there. And I don't even have to touch it or cut anything up or anything like that. So I think doing all the things that I just said about how to cook it minimizes the amount of time that you have to handle it and be grossed out by it as well. And also this whole episode, I want to remind you that you can eat more meat and meet your protein goal, but it doesn't mean that you have to do it at every single meal. I easily hit hundred grams of protein with only really doing one serving of meat a day. If you're using something like yogurt or protein shakes or eggs, or even like making sure you're doing whole grains has a lot of protein in it. So again, when we're talking about eating more meat, it doesn't mean that like literally every time you eat, you're going to eat a meat and that's going to make you sick. It just means like maybe once a day, choose a meal that has meat in it. So that also is going to help you minimize the amount of time you have to handle this raw meat. The fourth problem that I'm going to help you with is that it just gives you the ick. Somebody commented this on Instagram and I laughed because yes, I get it. And so my tips are just don't make it the star. Cause again, I, this is me. This is, this podcast is literally just for me <laughs> because it gives me the ick too, especially if it's like a whole cut of meat on a plate. Like I'm not even ordering that when I'm out. And so I think a solution for this that I can pull from is just don't make it the star. If it gives you the ick, like don't do the typical American meal. That's like meat, vegetable, potatoes, mix it in stuff. Do a lasagna, do a spaghetti, do a soup. 
Uh, what else do I do? I love like especially a lot. Of, I feel like a lot of like Asian foods do this really well with like dumplings or chicken lettuce wraps. Or I have it on my list this weekend to try to make some Vietnamese summer rolls because again you're like hiding it in something. Put it in a salad. Like just don't make it the star where you're having to like literally cut into it. And I think this helps a lot with the the thinking of the meat on your plate. Also, trying meat out can help you to get inspiration for how to cook it. I think for me, I don't find it gross when something has more of like a lemony flavor, especially when it comes to fish. And so I try to push myself to try different types of meat if I want to when I'm out or try different things with meat in them to see how they make it and then emulate that at home. And then also just try different types of meat. I think especially when it comes to fish, I wish people had more fish and they don't. So some ideas when it comes to fish besides just salmon, because I feel like that's all people do are mahi, cod, halibut, bass, again, like catfish, lobster, crab, oysters, crayfish. And I'm sorry if you don't live on the coast. I just moved to Charleston. And so I'm so excited to actually have like local fish. Um, but frozen is great and it's just as healthy and it's super easy. I actually, I mean, a lot of these fish that I just said aren't even in the Charleston area. And so I get it frozen from Food Lion or Costco or Aldi and it's just as fine. And a lot of the seafood that you will get at Whole Foods comes from frozen. So I'm like, sometimes it maybe doesn't even matter unless you're like literally going to your local fishmonger. They probably came from frozen anywhere. So I think that if you are burnt out on the chicken situation, try different fish and see if that helps. They have a very different texture. It has a very different flavor and it's typically a lot easier to cook. There's a lot less cooking time because it's not as thick. So just give it a try. Well, I hope that helps you break down some of your problems with meat. If you're trying to lose weight and you need to get in more protein and you're wanting to go about it by eating more meat, I put a lot of thought into this episode. I have a lot of links for all the studies just in case you want to check it or anything. Um, but if you do need help with meeting your protein goal, we definitely work on that in the program. I give a lot of recommendations. Of course, if you don't like meat at all, we work with vegans and vegetarians. So it'll be nothing that I ever push on you, but if it is something that you want to do, then I'll help you in that direction with a lot of the tips that I just said. So I hope this helps you take care and I will see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. For daily weight loss tips and nutrition information, you can find us on Instagram at the.millennial.nutritionist and on TikTok at millennial.nutritionist. If you find this information helpful, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend who needs encouragement on their health journey. See you in the next episode.